tonight's story is a channel exclusive by the wonderful mind of Brandy Gray. As ever, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. And of course, don't forget to hashtag Team Fear. And so, with that aside, let's get into tonight's story, entitled An Alpha's Responsibility. Let's get straight into that. Daniel Green had taken the same route home nearly every day for the past eight years. It took him through some of the densest forests in the area. It was only a 10 minute drive though, which was better than the highway, which would take nearly an hour. The most eventful thing that had ever happened was when he ran into a fallen log after a storm. There were no street lights, but for some reason animals had never really been a problem. And in eight years he'd seen probably a total of three deer. He was just looking up from switching off the radio and the CD player on. It always stopped working a few miles in. That's when it happened. He looked up to see a large lumbering shape run in front of his car. It wasn't a deer. It was too big. There were no bears in the area and he swerved to miss it and regretted it immediately. His car started down a tree-laden slope. He tried to hit the brakes but it did no good. The hill was muddy from a recent icy rain and everything went black when a car struck a tree. He's coming too, Mike. The voice was raspy, and he blinked to open his eyes. And there was a woman's old wrinkly face leaning over him. To say the woman looked a hundred would be an insult to all hundred-year-olds. She looked like tree bark with a face. I see that, Nana. Now back off before you scare him. He turned his head. When his neck hurt, his head hurt, and he was pretty sure his collarbone was broken. Ah, try not to move too much the man said as he came into view. I'm Mikkel Reinson, and this is my grandmother, Nana Helene. What happened? The two exchanged a glance. We were hoping you could tell us, and Daniel racked his brain. I was driving home. There was an animal. He froze. What was that thing? He continued. I swerved so I wouldn't hit it, and then went down the bank. That's all I remember. The two again glanced at each other, and it hit him. Why didn't you call me an ambulance? He was starting to feel that something wasn't right with these people. The old woman offered him a smile with no teeth, and lumbered towards a window, opening the curtains. I'm afraid self-service out here isn't very good, and this blizzard started right as we found you, so we couldn't go for help. He looked out the window to see endless white my brother and I set a shoulder and I don't think there's anything wrong with your neck or head, aside from a little whiplash, maybe. Everything they said made sense, still something didn't seem right. It was silent for a while before there was a small timid knock at the door. It opened to a small timid woman, and she was stick thin and could be no taller than five feet. She whispered to the old woman and then scampered away. Supper's done, if you'd like to come join us. She said, and he nodded. Mikkel came over to help him stand. By the way, we never got your name. He had just been wondering why they hadn't asked, and then he noticed his clothes had been changed. Oh, that? Well, you were covered in snow and blood by the time we got you back here. We didn't want you to catch the cold, so we'll lend you some of my late father's clothing. It was a good fit. He nodded. Thank you. I'm Daniel, by the way. Daniel Green. It's a pleasure. Mikkel said as he led him into a hall. He was in a cabin. It wasn't very big, and the wood was dark, very dark. The hallway they were in was lit with candles, and he realised it had been a kerosene lamp that had lit the bedroom. When they reached the end of the hallway, they appeared to be in a dining room. There was a fairly large table that honestly was much too big for the space, and the room was lit by a roaring fire in the fireplace in the corner. Two men were seated at a table, one who had to be every bit as old as Nana Helene and another man, who looked to be around thirty or so. The younger man looked positively livid about something, and he couldn't see the small woman from earlier anywhere. 
and Mikel set him down into one of the chairs. Sorry about the lighting. Electricity's out with the blizzard. Allow me to introduce you. This is my brother, Regis. The girl from earlier was his wife, Alma. And this is my grandfather, Nana Helene's husband, Nicholas. Mikel said before taking a seat beside him. Oh, thank you for helping me, he said, bowing his head to them. The old man gave him a small smile. The younger man, however, was eyeing him angrily. The younger woman walked back into the room, then carrying a larger platter of food. She sat it down on the table, and once she did, Regis grabbed her by the wrist and yanked her hard down into the chair beside him. Daniel started to protest, but bit his tongue. They ate in silence, and Regis never taken his eyes off him until they were done. So, Daniel, was it? I hear you nearly hit some kind of animal, and that's what sent you down the bank. How could he have known that? He told the two in the bedroom what happened, but neither had been alone with the man to say anything since. And then he realised that these walls were pretty thin. He'd probably simply overheard. Regis sat back in his seat, and the small frail girl immediately got up and ran to fetch him a drink from a decanter in the corner of the room. That's right. Did you see what kind of animal it was? He asked this question as if far too interested in his answer, as if somehow something had hinged on whatever he had to say. Not really. It was too dark. It was too big to be a deer, though. If I didn't know better, I'd say a bear. Everyone at the table exchanged a glance, and finally Regis sighed, downed his drink, and stood pulling the girl to her feet. Alma and I are going home for the night. We'll see what we can do to get our guest out of here in the morning, he said, then walking to the door. Oh, you'll have to forgive my grandson, the old man said. His voice was deep, still, but raspy with age. He's an entitled little son of a bitch, and Daniel startled a bit by the old man's words, but laughed a little when he smiled. If he can drive home, why couldn't one of you drive me into town, he asked and there was still something that didn't feel right about this whole thing. He isn't driving home, he's walking. It's only about a five minute walk to his house, and that's in this weather. The whole family lives pretty close together. This is my grandparents' house. My house is a little ways away, as is my brothers, aunts, uncles, and cousins. He froze with a look on his face, as if he had said too much. Uh, we're a close-knit family, he said, setting him down on the side of the bed. Still, having no privacy like that must not be easy. He smiled and then laughed a little. Trust me, it's not. Daniel laid down and it wasn't long before he fell asleep. A creak in the floorboards was what had woken him, or perhaps it was the raised voices. I don't care. I'll be in charge soon. You're well past the age to turn the power over to me. It's my birthright. The minute my father died... It should have been turned over to me, not back to you. As the patriarch of this family, I decide who rules our pack. Not you. You're a weak old man of mind and body. The minute we found him, we should have killed him. It was the right thing to do. Now the whole pack is in danger if we let him go, and he had any inkling of what we are. The children, Arista's unborn pups, because he thought a human could be trusted. My father and mother and so many others lost their lives. And we had to uproot the whole family. I will not make that mistake, grandfather. It isn't your decision to make. He saw nothing. He knows nothing. In the morning, you and your cousins will dig out his car and get it back up the hill. You will push it far up the road and then cover the tracks so no one can see where it went down. You will take him to the hospital and it will be done with. And it was quiet for a while after that, and then Daniel heard Regis's ominous voice. And we'll see. He had to get out of there. These people were insane, and at least a few of them wanted him dead. He found his shoes in the corner and slipped them on before making his way to the window. He opened it as quietly as he could, and shoulder and collarbone protesting the whole time. Finally, he managed to get it open just enough to climb outside. Oh, it was freezing, and with the wind whipping the snow around him, he was nearly blind. 
He looked for a vehicle, something maybe he could steal to get him back to town, but he didn't see one. He didn't even know where town was. He figured all he could do was pick a direction and head in it, but he had to be careful. Now, apparently, this psycho family was quite large, and they could be anywhere. He picked a direction and started walking. About an hour passed without seeing anyone. There were several dilapidated looking shacks and trailers, but as he passed all of their windows, they were dark. He reached a clearing, and the blizzard had let up considerably as he walked, and now it was merely flurrying. He looked up and the moon was bright, peeking from the opening in the clouds, shining brightly on the snow in front of him, and then he froze in its tracks. At the top of a hill was something. It was standing on its hind legs, and it was covered in brown fur from head to toe. And there was a little snow resting on its coat, but not much. As he looked at it, he could tell it was female, and he thought it might have been pregnant. Its face or muzzle was looking up at the moon. It seemed to be bathing in the moonlight, cradling its swollen stomach. It was in that moment he knew he must have officially lost his mind. He took a step back and somehow managed to find one spot on the ground without snow, and his foot landed on a frozen twig that snapped audibly in the suddenly silent night. The figure on the hill turned in his direction, lips parting into a growl. Another one of those things came forward from the other side of the hill on all fours, teeth bared, looking for a sound. It spotted him and froze, and then it stood and walked on its hind legs over to the female. It nuzzled her neck with its muzzle before walking slowly towards him. He was too frightened to move. As it walked, it seemed to twitch a little. It drew in on itself about halfway to him, and then exploded. Well, that's what it seemed. He shielded his eyes as part of it went flying. Ah, bathing in the moonlight of the last days of pregnancy ensures strong pups. He looked up. Mikkel was standing in front of him, stark naked. Man, Daniel, I wish you hadn't seen that. At that moment, the figure on the hill let out an ear-piercing howl. Noises erupted around him, and banging of doors followed by multiple howls. He took a step back, but he knew he was quickly being surrounded. He looked around, and there were dozens of these creatures, some bigger and some smaller, some with red fur and some with brown, black and grey. He turned as two came closer from his left. These two were older, wrinkly grey hair missing in some spots. And somehow, though he didn't know how he knew, he knew that those two were Helene and Nicholas. I'm sorry, Daniel. We fully intended to let you go. You'd have gone on with your life and just completely forgotten about this experience. The time for talking is over. He turned to the right, and these words had been human, but the growl was that of a wolf. He turned to see Regis approaching, and he was naked, but human. A small, scrawny, gangly wolf thing at his side on all fours. Enough, Regis. Every man deserves to know why he is going to die. Mikkel took a slow step forward. Our family has lost so much due to your kind. I get it. Throughout the centuries, your kind has lost a great much because of our kind. But it's different now. Most of my family just wants to live in peace. We survive off animals. We live, love, and breed. He said, turning to the thing on the hill still clutching his stomach. Those are my pups in there. I have to protect them just like any father. I won't, Daniel started to say, taking a step back. We can't take that chance. I know what you're thinking. Even if you did say anything, people would just think you're crazy. And for the most part, that's true. But even in this day and age, hunters still exist. And there are those that will believe you, Daniel Green. Fifteen years ago, a man discovered my father's secret when he struck him with his car. In his pain, my father reverted back to his form. The man was kind and still helped him, but no one of the existence of our kind was too much for him and drove him to drink. One drunken night, three years later, he spilled his secret at a bar and a hunter overheard. He got the man to show him to our home and he slaughtered a great many of our family. My mother, my father, 
Regis's first wife, and even our children. We cannot risk that ever again. Danny then turned to run, but it was useless. He was completely surrounded. He turned left, and the two older wolves looked like the weakest of the bunch. He took a deep breath and ran full out in their direction, hoping to sidestep when one lunged. The world went black when Nana Helene hit him upside the head with a deceptively powerful hit. His body felt heavy. He was exhausted, though he had a feeling that he'd been asleep for quite a while. He groaned and rolled over to his side and reached blindly for his bedside table and his cell phone. He opened his eyes in confusion when his hand hit an empty space. He wasn't in his bedroom. He shot up in bed and looked around when he recognised the room that he was in. He'd had a nightmare about werewolves of all things. He must still be asleep. And there were two people standing on the other side of the small room by the window. They'd obviously been looking out, but they were staring at him now. He recognised the man, and the woman standing beside him was pregnant, very pregnant. An image of the female werewolf from his dream, the one standing on the shaft of moonlight, entered his mind, and he knew this woman as her. Neither of them said anything as they stared at him. Mikhail with what could be only described as pity, the woman with weariness. He lifted his right hand from the bed and then took a deep breath before smacking the living hell out of himself. He cried out in surprised pain, surprised because he expected it to not hurt. You weren't supposed to get hurt in dreams or nightmares. He turned when the door opened and Helene poked her head in, a concerned look on her old wrinkled face. He didn't realise he was screaming till Mikkel shook him and the sound cut off. It's okay, Daniel. You have my word, you will not be harmed. Just breathe, Mikhail said and turned to Helene. Will you take Arista to your room to lie down for a while? I believe Mr. Green and I need to have a talk. He watched as the woman reluctantly made her way out of the room and she was eyeing him suspiciously the whole time. It was interesting to note that a werewolf seemed wary of him and he had to be losing his mind. You're not real. You can't be real. Werewolves aren't real, he blurted after a minute of Mikkel just sitting there staring at him, and then sighed. Well, that slap felt pretty real, didn't it? He couldn't argue, his cheek still stung. My family's been afflicted with this curse for generations, going back nearly a thousand years. How the curse started isn't remembered in our stories. Daniel, as a rule, werewolves don't hurt humans. There are accidents. Hikers camp in the wrong place at the wrong time. And sometimes the young make mistakes, and sometimes we get seen by those people. And the Alpha has to make a choice. Our secret has been kept, Daniel. We've lost too many of our own to werewolf hunters. He stood, then to retrieve the glass of water that Helene brought into the room. Daniel noticed he was limping, and he hadn't noticed it earlier. Why are you telling me all of this? Why didn't you kill me last night? You said you were going to kill me. I remember. Daniel said, just staring at the water the man had offered. He sighed and sat it on the table to the right of the bed. <sighs> Tell me, Daniel, he said, ignoring his question. Do you have any family? No, there's no one, I swear. I haven't had anyone close for years. There's no one I even really talk to, except for the guys at work. I won't tell anyone, if you let me go, I swear. Letting you go, that isn't within my power, but letting you live is. It's not that you're a prisoner, you can come and go, even eventually go back to work. It's just best you stay around the camp for a while, until you get used to things. What things? Suddenly Daniel had a feeling. It would have been better had he not woken up at all today. How do you feel? He asked, ignoring him again, and he froze. Yesterday, his shoulder had hurt like hell, and he'd been fairly certain he'd broken something in his collar. Today, though, he was feeling stiff and sore, but those pains, they were gone. How long was I out? He asked, ignoring Mikkel's question for a change. Two days. But my shoulder and my collar, he said and looked down. He realised he wasn't wearing a shirt, and on his shoulder, 
he could just make out what looked like a bite mark. It looked months old and definitely hadn't been there two days ago. By tomorrow, that won't even be there. You'll heal way quicker now. You won't get sick. You're way stronger than you ever were before. What did you do to me? He spoke low, knowing he didn't want to know the answer. Mikkel, in his defense, looked ashamed. We just wanted you dead. No outsider can know our secret, but it wasn't right. You'd done nothing wrong, and it wasn't right to kill you for something you might do in the future, and so I challenged him. He is the oldest. When Grandfather died, the mantle of Alpha would have passed to him, but with Grandfather's permission, I challenged him for the right, and I won. He took a chunk out of my leg and snapped my femur in half, but I won. I made him submit. Grandfather immediately stepped down, and I am Alpha now, and I chose. What did you do? Daniel yelled. Ah, <sighs> You're not a risk to exposing our secret anymore, Daniel, because it's your secret as well now. My first act as Alpha was to turn you into a werewolf. The Alpha's Responsibility Part 2 Let's get straight into that. Daniel hadn't known what to say. His mind was in chaos. He couldn't deny anymore that he was awake, which meant werewolves were real. Oddly enough, that was starting to become easier to wrap his mind around than the fact that he was now one. He didn't feel any different. Well, that wasn't exactly true. He felt stronger somehow. He was still sore, but, but at the same time he felt healthier than he'd ever done before in his life. He wasn't sure how long had passed since Mikau had sighed and left the room. He didn't blame him. After all, he'd just sat there and stared at him after his declaration. He was sitting on a small chest looking out the window. There were several children outside enjoying the snow, having a snowball fight and building snowmen. It all seemed so normal. He noticed one boy who looked to be around eight throwing snowballs at a smaller girl. She didn't look any older than four. Well, he just started to think how unfair that was when the boy turned away and the girl dropped down to all fours before launching herself onto the boy's back and knocking him face down into the snow. This caused a round of laughter from the nearby children and the parents watching them play. It seemed she could take care of herself, at least. He hadn't once thought of escape since Mikhail had left the room. Well, he was right. No one would believe what had happened to him. He wasn't even sure he did, and if someone did believe him, it would only get him killed. He wasn't sure if that would be a better alternative or not. Mikhail hadn't went into much detail about what all this meant. Of course, he hadn't really given him a chance to. These people were his only chance of understanding what he was now. How could he control himself if such a thing were possible? He didn't think he could handle it if he accidentally hurt someone. Oh, I've gone insane, he said aloud and jumped when he heard the door opening behind him. He turned to see Arista in the doorway. She sat what looked like a bowl of soup down on the table by the bed. Thank you, he said and turned back towards the window. He could still sense her behind him, but she didn't come any closer. He turned back to face her. My husband trusts you, she said. He turned away again to look out the window. Most of the children were already gone, or were heading back inside. Must be dinner time. You don't, he asked finally, when she just stood there. He couldn't face her for some reason, like he'd done something wrong, which is crazy, considering what they'd done to him. I don't know if I can trust you. You're one of us now, but, but you're a stranger. And she was quiet for a moment. We haven't had much luck with strangers, but my husband has a very kind and trusting nature. He got it from his father. He turned back to her then. That's a bad thing. And she shrugged, but her words were sad. I got him, and many others of our family killed, she said before finally leaving the room. <laughs> 
Hours later, he turned when the door eased open just a crack and an unfamiliar face peeked in. It was a woman. She looked straight at the bed and opened the door farther to look into the rest of the room. It was dim, and there was apparently still no power, and he hadn't bothered lighting the kerosene lamp. But she didn't seem to have a problem spotting him. There you are. Sorry, I would have knocked louder, but I was afraid you'd be asleep. He shook his head. He was exhausted, and he had tried to go to sleep earlier, but his thoughts were racing too much for his mind to shut off when he tried to lay in bed. Oddly enough, sitting here looking out into the night had calmed his racing thoughts. The night was peaceful. No, I can't sleep. He could just about make out enough of the moonlight shining in to see her nod her head. And she stepped in and shut the door behind her without waiting for an invitation to do so. He heard the sound of a match striking and watched as the small flame moved to where he knew the bedside table sat. After that, the room was illuminated with light. Uh, your eyesight probably improved some already, but it probably hasn't got up to peak yet. And she sat down on a bed and turned to him offering him a smile. Hello, my name's Veronica. I spoke to Mikkel, or the Alpha. And she shook her head. I'm sorry, still having trouble wrapping my head around that one. Anyway, he said that you won't leave the room. He said he tried to talk to you a bit earlier, but you were still in shock. He asked me if I'd come check on you. You must have questions. Or oh, he had questions. So many, in fact, he didn't know where to start. They both jumped when they heard the door slam, and he turned back towards the window when he noticed movement out the corner of his eye. He could just about make out Regis storming off into the trees. He was here, he asked with concern. It was probably a good thing he hadn't left the room. He turned back to the girl, and when she sighed. <sighs> he has been since the fight. He was pretty banged up. Helene insisted he stay until he was well enough to move and she shrugged her shoulders. She worries for him. He is her grandson, after all. He shook his head. I... I don't understand how someone like him can be related to Mikkel. It was strange. The man had admitted to biting him and turning him into a werewolf, yet he couldn't force himself to hate him. He just seemed like too good a person for that. I can't imagine you'd like him very much, seeing how adamant he's been about killing you. All this time, she said with a sigh. Personally, I can't stand him anymore. The way he treats Alma. He didn't used to be like that, though. Before he lost his wife, he was a good person. Sad and way overprotective. But he never would have treated her that way. He worshipped the ground that she walked on, as they say. Sad? he asked. He was being nosy, but he also was delaying the inevitable. The longer he could go without having to think about what he was now, the better. And she nodded. Mikhail and Regis had a younger sister. As oldest, the responsibility of watching over the two of them fell on Regis. Once he became an adult, Mikhail liked to run on his own. But as Kenthia was still young, only sixteen at the time, he was still responsible for her. And she was killed by a hunter. About eighteen years ago, I think it was. Not even a werewolf hunter, just a hunter. Kenthia had a thing. Every time she came across an animal in a hunter's trap, she set it free. Said every creature deserved a fighting chance. There was a hunter that lived nearby, kept bear traps, snares and other traps, and set up all over his property. And every night she'd set them off and free every poor creature, unfortunate enough to get themselves caught. And finally, he got wise. He had a trap set up with a young buck in it, and then he hid nearby, coated himself in deer urine to hide his scent, and waited. And Kenthia, she took the bait. Her and Regis were out for a run. He hates himself for hanging back and waiting, but he did. The hunter came out screaming and shut her several times. Regis tore him to shreds. And Daniel sat back in silence. He couldn't really say he blamed Regis for what he had done to the hunter. Having to watch someone he loved die like that, and he swallowed hard. So, he said with a sigh, oh, silver bullets? And she laughed a little. Just a myth. Like all men, any kind of bullet can kill us. 
It is a fatal shot, heart or brain. Anything else and we can heal from it. He stood from the trunk and went to sit beside her on the bed. What else? He asked with a sigh. Might as well get it over with. The sooner he came to terms with what was happening, the sooner he could move on with his life, or what was left of it. Can kill you, she asked and smiled pat in his hand. The whole wolfsbane thing is true, though to be fair that would kill anyone who ingests it, though it's a bit more painful for us. But things like cancer or heart disease are no longer something you have to worry about. Well, until you're older. Once you get to be as old as Helene and Nicholas, whatever it is that keeps us strong starts to fade. Though, as you probably can tell, not quickly. And they will both be turning 87 this year. And Helene's mother is still alive at the age of 104. Rowan can't shift anymore, but she can still get around after the little ones when they get on her nerves. She said with a laugh. He blinked in shock. It wasn't like he hadn't heard of people living to be that old before. But she made it sound like that was the norm for her kind. Their kind. Okay, that's probably enough for tonight. You look like you're going to pass out on me. He shook his head, and the more he tried to wrap his mind around everything, the more exhausted he became. Don't worry, I'll stop by tomorrow and we'll talk more. I'll answer any question you have. Well, as long as I know the answer. He nodded as she stood and pulled his blankets down for him. She patted her bed and smiled. Your husband won't mind? He asked as she stood. He wasn't quite sure why he'd asked her that. He hadn't seen a ring, though that might not have meant much for werewolves. And she laughed a little. If that was one of those weird man ways of asking me if I'm single, then yes, I am, she sighed. I was almost married once, but thankfully I got out of it. And she started for the door. Thankfully? She turned back and nodded, and he stretched out across the bed. Very thankfully, I almost ended up married to Regis. He sat back up and waved his head towards her. Why would you ever want to marry him? He asked, lowering his voice when he remembered he was currently in a man's grandparents' home. And she shook her head. I wouldn't, and that's why I'm so thankful Nicholas got me out of it. But, and she interrupted him. No more buts. I promise. We'll talk tomorrow, but you need sleep. Your body's still changing, and you'll be back to normal in a few days. Well, normal is relative term, but still, she said, offering him a smile. And he sighed and lay back down, letting his eyes drift closed. His sleep had been dreamless, thank goodness. He wouldn't even let his mind revisit the nightmares he was expecting to have. And the sun was high in the sky when he awoke. He couldn't be sure, but it was probably nearly three in the morning when Veronica left. He moved to the edge of the bed and sighed. He ignored the soup that Arista had brought him, hadn't touched a pitcher of water that Helene had sat next to his bed, and now he was starving and thirsty. He couldn't do much about the hunger at the moment, but he reached out and poured himself glass after glass of water till he finished half of the pitcher. He stood. He needed food and more answers. Mikhail had told him he wasn't a prisoner, but he also knew he couldn't live in Helene and Nicholas's back room for the rest of his life. He was cautious as he stepped out of the room. If Regis had come back, he didn't think he was in any shape for a confrontation. And the house was relatively quiet, except for some small banging noises coming from somewhere off the small dining room they'd eaten in their meal and the other night. It was a kitchen, and when he rounded the corner, he saw Helene standing at the sink, scrubbing dishes. Would you like some help with those? The old woman spun around like she hadn't noticed him approach, and grabbed out her chest, and for a brief moment, he was afraid he'd given a poor woman a heart attack. And he rushed forward to her side. Are you all right, sir? Do you need me to go find someone? And she didn't respond at first, just scowled at him for a minute, and then, smacked him on the arm with a soapy hand. Didn't anyone ever tell you not to sneak up on an old lady? She said, but her wrinkly face cracked a grin, and he smiled back. <laughs> Sorry, I just... I thought you would have heard me. And he noticed that his own hearing seemed to be improving. 
He just assumed that she would have been able to hear him approaching. And she shook her head at him and turned back to her work. Ah, the hearing's one of the first things to go once you get to my age. And she turned back when his stomach grumbled audibly. But I still heard that, she said, offering him another smile. Go set a table. I'll make you some breakfast. And he started to protest, but he didn't want to impose, though at this point he was hungry enough to eat a horse. And he was a bit surprised when she began pushing him out of the room. For an 86-year-old, she still had a good bit of strength. Now, I don't want to hear it. You're a part of this pack now, and that makes you one of my grandbabies. And Nana takes care of her grandbabies. Her words had been sincere and full of feeling. He didn't know what to say. It was hard to consolidate the image of this woman, who was very much a kind of normal grandmother type, with the image of the wolf who had knocked him unconscious the other night with one hit. He sat down at the table and looked around. He noticed a clock on the wall by the front door. It was one thirty in the afternoon. His nose took a sniff of the air when he smelled the bacon frying. He had been drooling any minute if he didn't distract himself. He stood and looked around. Maybe it wasn't wise to snoop through the house of the pack's patriarch and matriarch, but he had to occupy his mind somehow. Helene and Nicholas had a lot of plants in the small living room, dining room area, and not much else. There was a photograph wedged between two large potted ferns behind the table. And though they were younger, he clearly recognised Mikkel and Regis. Between them was a girl who appeared to be around twelve in a photo. It must have been that ill-fated sister, Kenthia. Behind the three, a man stood tall, one hand placed on both of the boy's shoulders. And he looked an awful lot like Mikkel. Beside him was a woman with a bright beaming smile. She had the same eyes and hair as Regis. And Regis was smiling. He actually looked like a decent person in the photo. My son, daughter-in-law and granddaughter. He jumped and spun around. Helene took her sad eyes off the photo. He was staring at her, look up at him and offer him a small smile. Not so fun being startled, is it, young man? She said, setting his plate down on the table in front of him. He wasn't sure what to say. Thank you. He said, finally, sitting down in front of the food. Eggs, bacon, sausage. At least he didn't have to worry about cholesterol anymore. She sat down in front of him as he ate, and he was a little uncomfortable by the silence. She didn't break it until he finished every bite. I see little Veronica had a good effect on you. At least you finally left the bedroom. He nodded. She told me some things. She said she'd come by again today and we'd talk more. He said, looking past her to check the clock again. It was just after two. Helene followed his gaze. Are you eager to see her again? She asked with a smile. It's early yet. She'll just now be getting out of bed. And then she has school. She'll be by later. Early? It was afternoon. Granted, it had been late when she left, and what about school? If he had had to guess, he'd have said the woman looked to be in her late twenties. Maybe a college student. Helene seemed to sense his thoughts, and said, Most of us sleep the day away and stay up through the night. Some people have jobs that prevent that, but it's the way we prefer it. I'm sure you noticed, even this early into your change, the pool the night has for you. And the look in her eyes turned sad again. Of course, I don't sleep much any time of day anymore. I haven't in years since, well, since that hunter came. And he looked down at his empty plate. Oh, I'm sorry about what happened. Just so you know, I never would have. He trowed off. None of that mattered anymore, did it? Oh, I can tell you're a good person. My Mikhail is a great judge of character. And don't you worry about my Regis. He's a grouchy as a bear, but he has a good heart in there somewhere still. I have to believe that. When she spoke, it was obvious he wasn't the only one she was trying to convince with that statement. He didn't think he was the only one that doubted it, either. Instead of voicing it aloud, he asked, She had school? <laughs>
and Helene smiled. Well, she's the school teacher. Classes go from three to seven on weekdays. and She teaches all the children, no matter what age. It's the first time since the pack began that the kids are getting a formal education. It's why Nicholas agreed to let her head off to college when she asked. Helene said with pride of any grandmother. Well, that end. And she trailed off. He smiled a little, and so she was a schoolteacher to the children of the pack. He couldn't miss the uncomfortable look on her old, wrinkled face when she said, and he couldn't help but ask. And she sighed. Carmen, Regis' first wife, was Veronica's sister. Regis was in line to be Alpha. Throughout history of our pack, Carmen and Veronica's family have been known to be the beauty of their woman and for the strength of the pups, birthed by them. Carmen was promised to Regis the day she was born, but it wasn't just an arrangement between them. They loved each other greatly, and she was pregnant with his first pup when a hunter came. Regis was devastated. But since she was gone, the way our laws worked for generations, when the next oldest female in the line was now his, and that's, that was Veronica. Regis wouldn't even discuss marrying someone else for years, and the longer he was alone, the more bitter he became. And then a few years ago, he decided it was time to remarry. But Nicholas sensed his bitterness and how afraid Veronica was to be his wife. And so when Veronica came to him to ask to go to college, instead of marrying Regis, he jumped at the opportunity to send her away. After all, having someone with a teacher's degree teaching the next generations was what was best for the pack, and that would outweigh any previous arrangements. Well, Regis was angry, and he was to be Alpha. He needed a wife to pass on his seed and carry the line. He said the duty of marrying Regis went to the next in line, her cousin, Alma. And didn't any of them have any kind of say in this? He asked, voice rising in anger. He thought of a way Regis treated poor Alma, he had never seen him strike her, but he didn't doubt he did by the way the poor girl slinked around like an abused animal. Helene took a deep breath and sighed. <sighs> the werewolf community isn't nearly as advanced as the rest of the world. We women don't have nearly as many rights as the ones outside of our community. There you are. Danny jumped and turned to the sound of the voice. He had been concentrating so hard on the things Helene had been saying that he hadn't even heard Nicholas approach. You need to rest, love, he said in his old gravelly voice as he approached the table. He noticed that the woman did look absolutely exhausted. Nicholas turned to him. Ah, you'll find Veronica at the schoolhouse. Well, it's not far. He told him how to get there. I would do you good to walk around, get to know your new home better he said before leading a protesting Helene farther back into the home. He sighed and stood. This was his new home now. Like it or not, he might as well look around. It had been impossible to see much the night he escaped, and when he stepped outside, snow still covered the ground. But it was obvious most of it had melted away early in the day. Bits of earth peeked out from underneath. It was relatively quiet as he walked and he wondered if most of the people in the trailers and shacks he passed were still asleep. Well, it was possible. The way Helene had made it sound, the only people with young children would be up now, getting them ready for school, just like a normal family. Well, if it wasn't the middle of the afternoon. He found the building easily. It wasn't exactly what you would expect as a school, just an old metal building that looked like it might have been a mechanic's garage at some point, but it was definitely the biggest building he'd seen in the compound thus far. The inside of the garage looked very much like a classroom, at least to one side. There was a dry erase board with what he assumed to be the teacher's desk sitting directly in front of it. In front of those were about 30 heavily used student desks, the old ones with the chairs attached to them. There were a few other tables ringing the area. One held beakers while the other was piled high with art supplies. Daniel? And he turned to see Veronica, and she was coming out of a door on the opposite side of the makeshift classroom, her arms full of small booklets 
Nicholas sent me over. I think just to get me out of the house, mainly. Let me help with those, he said, reaching for the bundle in her arms. And she smiled and walked over to set her half down on the desk. She looked up at the clock. Well, the children will start arriving any minute, so we'll have to put the rest of our talk on hold, I'm afraid. If you're looking for something to do, how about sitting in class today? It's a lot different than what you're used to, I'm sure. I was homeschooled here like any of us who got any form of education where before now. But I did go off to college, and so I know things are vastly different out there. In my classroom, the children sit, starting from the back left in descending age. I work from front to back, assigning their task for the day. And I try to be available for each of them if they need help. But it's difficult when the little ones are on one side of the room, working on the alphabet, and the older ones are on the other side of the room, dissecting owl pellets. He nodded, unsure what to say. He supposed it wasn't feasible to have separate classrooms by grade like he was used to. For one thing, there was only one teacher. For another, there weren't nearly enough children to make up separate classes. Might make it easier if you held two classes a day, split down the middle. Younger students earlier in the day and then the older students come in after them. It would mean more work for you, but make it easier to give them one-on-one -on -one time. And she sat down at her desk and smiled. That's perfect, actually. I'll talk to Nicholas later and see if he approves. She said and then paused and shook her head. I mean, I'll talk to Mikkel about it later. This change is hard to get used to. She said with a laugh and stood. And he turned to see the first of the students arriving. You can sit there if you want, she said, pointing to a chair to the side of her desk. And he nodded and sat down. He felt sort of awkward. It reminded him of when he misbehaved in school as a child and was forced to spend the rest of the class doing his work at the teacher's desk. Within the next five minutes, all but four of the desks were full, and judging by the fact that the empty ones were side by side on the front row, he assumed all of the children were here. Welcome, class. As you see, we have a guest today. Everyone, this is Daniel Green, and he's the newest member of our pack. A few of the older children started whispering among themselves, and he was surprised he was able to hear some of what they were saying. It seemed he was the subject of gossip at many of the students' households. All right, everyone, settle down. Get last night's homework ready for me, and then we'll start discussing today's lesson. The child on the bottom right row was a little girl, who seemed to be no more than five, and she excitedly held out her workbook to show Veronica where she'd copied her alphabet. He watched her progress as she visited each student's desk. When she got to the boy in the middle, she patted him on the head and skipped past him. He didn't have a workbook or anything else on his desk. And Daniel took a good look at him. If he had to guess, he'd say the boy was around 14 years old, and honestly, he didn't look like he even knew where he was. He turned his attention away from him, and then he heard Ray's voices. I don't want to do anything. I don't want to do it. I'm not letting some unmated woman boss me around. The only reason I'm here is because the Alpha ordered me to be. Dylan, we've talked about this. You have to do your homework and pay attention in class. Otherwise, there's no reason for you to be here. And why should I listen to anything some stupid woman says? Well, Daniel was surprised when he felt a low growl rumbling in his chest. When it seemed everyone had heard it. The few who had been talking went quiet immediately and turned his way, including Veronica and the boy. He took a slow, deep breath to calm himself. Dylan, was it? he asked. He didn't move from his spot, just crossed his arms over his chest. He knew he should have become involved, that it was none of his business, but he couldn't stand to hear this little brat talking to Veronica that way. The boy, who seemed arrogant and fearless when talking to Veronica, responded. His voice shook a little as he did. Yeah, what of it? You're here because your alpha says you have to be, right? He asked and the boy seemed to regain some of his bravado. That's what I said, he nodded. And part of going to school is doing your work, listening to what the teacher says and being respectful. 
Veronica may be a woman, but seeing as she's had a college education, that makes her a hell of a lot smarter than either of us. And if you don't feel like listening to her and taking advantage of her lessons, then I may just have a talk with Mikkel myself when I leave here tonight. Is that what you would like? And the boy stared at him in the eyes for nearly a full minute before bowing his head in an obvious submission and putting his workbook out of his desk. Veronica turned to him and gave him a small smile before making her way through the rest of the room. I'll see you all tomorrow, Veronica called as the students started for the door. He stood and made his way to her side when the last one had exited. She didn't turn to him right away, but finally she said, About earlier. You didn't have to do that, but thanks. And he shook his head. Oh, it's no problem, he said, sitting down on the desk, and she walked behind it to gather up all the workbooks the children had turned in that day. Oh, I'm used to behavior like that from him. He's from one of the more traditional families. Most of us have embraced the new ways that Nicholas and Ramus put into effect, but there are some who still cling tightly to the old ways, she said before turning out the lights and pulling the door shut. Now, things were a lot worse when Bakor, Nicholas's dad, had been alpha. The man had been a traditionalist. Women weren't to speak unless spoken to. They were not allowed outside their homes unless accompanied by a male. They weren't even allowed to learn how to read. Helene was the first person to challenge the old ways. She was always a strong-willed woman, even flat out telling Nicholas no when she learned of their engagement. And of course he won her over, eventually. After she refused the betrothal, Barker had her punished. He chained her in a shed in the woods in the middle of the summer with no food and water. And Nicholas was fuming when he learned what his father had done. He demanded that his father release her, but his demands fell on deaf ears. He tried to release her himself, but her guards wouldn't allow him near the shack. And finally, at the end of her three days, he went with his father to release her. And she was obviously weak from dehydration and hunger, but when he asked her if she had learned the lesson, she pulled herself up from the ground and stood tall. She told him that women deserve to be treated better, and that no man had a right to lay his hand on a woman for any reason, and if she wanted an education, she should be allowed to get it. And Daniel listened to this story in shock, unsure what to say. No wonder Helene was a badass she was today, if that's what she'd been like in her youth. Of course, a man like that wouldn't let her get away with defying him especially not in front of witnesses. Well, how did he take it? And she stopped walking for a moment and leaned into a tree. Ah, about as well as you'd expect. He sentenced her to death. And Daniel's mouth opened in shock. Veronica nodded. Nicholas loved Helene. He told me it wasn't in spite of her strong will, but because of it. He begged his father to reconsider, but he wouldn't listen. And that's when Nicholas challenged him for the mantle. Oh, it was brutal. Most of the time when we get hurt, our wounds don't scar. And Nicholas's father nearly ripped his right arm off at the shoulder. He still sports the scar to this day. And Nicholas managed to get him down, but he wouldn't submit. He... <sighs> she sighed. He didn't have a choice. She said, pushing away from the tree, and she began walking again. They were quiet for a while, and he racked his brain for a way to change the subject. So, what was all that about? You being unmated? I mean, you're not even thirty yet. What's the hurry? Veronica gave a short break of laughter, and there was no humor in it. It was quiet again for a while before she answered. At my age, in a werewolf pack, if you're not mated, it's because you are undesirable. Deformities. There are even some born occasionally who can shift. And she stopped walking and looked at the ground. The gene pool around here isn't exactly the most diverse. We try to be careful. Most of us do when choosing a mate. But if you're from a family that didn't keep very good records of who married who and what not, sometimes, sometimes mistakes are made. And she didn't have to say any more. 
He remembered that poor boy in the classroom, the one who had unknown where he was. And when the children were leaving, one of the younger girls had grabbed his hand to lead him from the room. And she looked back up again and spoke intently. Since he took over from his dad, Nicholas has been doing everything he can to get all the family trees straight, so everyone knows who's related to who and how. To ensure things like that don't happen, but... I understand, really. You don't have to explain. And she nodded thankfully and started walking again. And he sighed. Oh, what about looking for someone in the city? And she shook her head. It would be impossible for one of us to be with a human and them not eventually find out. And as you know, secrecy, not just in a pack, but in all packs around the world, is the number one law. Not to say that it's never happened. The children develop and are born without any concerns. The werewolf gene is only passed on 50% of the time though. But the human partner always finds out eventually. And when they do, they are usually put to death. And she stopped walking again when he did. Nicholas would do that? He would kill a human simply, simply for falling in love with you? And she sighed. He hasn't had to, and nor did Ramus, but they would have, if necessary. You know what happened to us. You can't imagine how ingrained the fear is of it happening again. And that wasn't the first time our pack's been attacked since it was formed. Regis would have started a war with the humans if he had found enough support after what happened. It's just as much for human safety as it is for us, she said. Her voice made it sound like she was begging for his forgiveness. And he sighed. He hated to admit it, but he could see the necessity in the cruel thing she said. But not in the way the women were treated. And he would speak to Mikkel. It was time things in this pack became better for the women around here. Well, what about the wolves from other packs? She said there were other packs out there. He couldn't help but wonder how many of her kind were out there. Their kind, he had to remind himself. It was still hard to wrap his head around, and she shrugged her shoulders. Oh, that does happen on occasion. Most packs stay separate from one another. But on occasion, like when one is attacked by a hunter, the alphas within a certain radius will contact one another. They call it an alpha council, and sometimes when they have one of these... Women are traded to more diversify the gene pool. Well, his steps faltered again. They were being traded like cattle. And Barker did this a few times, but Nicholas put a stop to it. She said, placing a hand on his arm. Well, turns out trash attracts trash like magnets. And he stilled completely when he heard that voice. He looked up. He hadn't realized they'd gotten so close to Helene and Nicholas's home. And Regis was standing on the top step, staring down at them. Instinctively, Daniel took a small step forward and to the side, just enough to angle himself between Regis and Veronica. What do you want? he asked. Honestly, he was surprised his voice had been so strong when he'd asked it. He felt what Dylan must have felt when he was staring him down earlier. And some voice inside of him told him to show submission to this man. And he fought against it. He would never humble himself to a man like him. And Regis descended the steps slowly and stopped only a foot away. And Daniel fought the urge to step back. I came here to deliver a warning to you, he said, taking a step around him. He followed his movements, being sure to keep himself between Regis and Veronica. I don't give a damn what my brother or grandfather say. I'm watching you. You make one slip. Give me one reason to even for a moment think you might be a threat. And I'll rip you to shreds. He said right into his ear before turning to walk away. Let's get inside, Veronica said urgently. She grabbed a hold of his sleeve and he nodded and gave her a gentle push towards the house. She started mounting the steps, but Daniel, he didn't move at first. Hey, Regis! He called out without turning back towards him, and he heard the man's steps falter. I'll be watching you, too, he said, before walking slowly 
up to the porch, where Veronica waited in shock. The Alpha's Responsibility The Finale Let's get straight into that. Are you sure you're going to be okay here today? Veronica asked with concern. She hesitated by the door, and she'd been worried since the confrontation with Regis. He shrugged it off as best as he could, acting as if he weren't worried. But of course, he was. He'd been a werewolf for all of a day, and he'd made an enemy of the man who used to be next in line for Alpha. A man who was obviously unstable, and way more powerful than he was. I'll be fine, Veronica. You know, he's not going to come in here and start anything. He'll stand down for now, I'm sure, he said, though he was anything but. They both jumped three feet and turned towards the door when it burst open and banged into the wall. Where's grandmother? Mikhail called loudly, out of breath. Stop your hollering, boy, the old woman in question said as she walked out of her and Nicholas's bedroom a moment later. She took one look at her grandson and nodded her head. When Nicholas came out of the room a moment later, she turned to him. It's time to deliver our first great grandpups, she said, a smile spreading across her ancient, wrinkled face. Daniel turned back to Mikkel. He was leaning heavily into the doorframe. So, werewolf fathers freaked out when their wives went into labor too? Oh, that was interesting to note. Well, come along both of you, Helene said as she walked past them. She put a hand on her grandson's arm. Daniel, I need you to keep our papa calm. And Veronica, I'm not as young as I used to be. I could use your help with the delivery. He nodded, though he felt awkward as he approached. He just met these people. Shouldn't someone closer to the family be keeping him company? He was practically a stranger. My grandson has great respect for you, boy. Nicholas said as he put an arm over his shoulder and led him towards the door. We both expect great things from you, he said before shoving him out of the door and after the others. And Daniel watched as Mikhail paced back and forth across his living room. He had no children of his own, and honestly, he had never been close to anyone who ever had. He had no idea what to say to calm the man down. He said the first thing that popped into his mind. He meant it as a joke, but after he had said it, he was worried the man would take offence. So... Uh, are the kids going to be born little wear puppies or just normal babies? Well, he was relieved when the man stopped pacing and laughed. He sat down on the couch beside him, though his legs kept bouncing. We are born in this form. The first change doesn't take place until around puberty. He nodded. He'd actually been thinking this was probably the case. So I hear you sat on Veronica's class tonight. Well, how'd it go? Well, he hesitated. Now wasn't the time to go into it. The man was about to become a father. Um, maybe we should wait a few days to discuss it. Mikhail was bouncing stilled and he tilted his head in confusion. Now you've got me curious. Go on. I could use the distraction. He hesitated another moment before, telling him about the confrontation with the boy in class and a little bit about his talk with Veronica on the way home. He left out the confrontation with Regis on the porch. The man had enough to worry about, and honestly, he wanted to deal with Regis himself. Not that he had any idea of how to go about doing that. Mikhail leaned in into the back of the couch with a sigh. <sighs> my father and my grandfather have worked hard to make things better for the women of this pack. But you have to understand, for as far back as our histories go, and for no telling how long before that, things have been one way. Women were used for only pleasure and reproduction. Their job was to clean, prepare meals, and look after the pups. When packs clashed and war was called upon, the women were to remain behind and protect the pups with their lives, if necessary. Things have improved greatly these past two generations. If Veronica had even suggested she wanted to go to school instead of marrying Regis, great-grandfather would have had to have put her to death. She told you what he did to grandmother, he said sadly. I can't just go in overnight and change everything. Father 
and Grandfather took things gradually, because honestly, if I were to hold a gathering tomorrow, and tell everyone that women would now have the exact same rights in the pack as men, the more traditional families only would revolt. I don't know much about human history. It was never taught to us, but I do know of the Civil War. Imagine a smaller-scale version of that, with fangs and claws. And Daniel shivered. But surely, surely you realize some things have to change, Mikkel. The families who didn't keep good records, mistakes are going to continue to be made. And that weakens the pack, right? And Granny Helene said doing something that makes the pack stronger. Like when Grandfather Nicholas allowed Veronica to go off to school. That that was what was most important. And a man smiled and Daniel realized he'd refer to them as Granny Helene. And Grandfather Nicholas. Somehow it just just felt right. Hmm, I agree, but what do you suggest? Veronica told you what the packs usually do in these times, like these. Surely you aren't suggesting we trade our single women like cattle. He shook his head. Can't you, can't you hold one of those Alpha Council things? Surely at least some of the other Alphas are advanced enough to at least try to come up with a better alternative. Perhaps you can set it up to where the young people of the packs are, allowed to choose for themselves, who to be with. And he shook his head. Well, that's not that simple, Daniel. Whose pack would they belong to? And the children. To some alphas, the individuals do not matter, only the numbers. Things are different than the older days. And hunter attacks are so much rarer. But there are still occasional pack wars. Packs want to maintain their numbers. To maintain their strength. Well, what if that ordinates? If there are six couples formed between a pack A and pack B, three couples become part of pack A and three pack B. And of course that presented its own problems when it came to the individual's rights. What if the couples that ended up in pack A really wanted to be in pack B? This way people would still get separated from family members. Choices would still get taken away. I can tell you see the problem with your suggestion, but it's something to think about. We'll talk more on it later. Daniel jumped when the door opened without someone knocking first. Regis stepped inside, flanked by Alma. He took one look at him and scowled before turning to his brother. What are you doing here, Regis? Mikkel asked as he stood. Regis shook his head. We may be having a difference of opinion, he sighed. And for the first time since Daniel had met him, he looked almost kind when he spoke next. But you are still my brother. And those pups are still my family. I should be by your side right now. And Daniel stood. He opened his mouth to say he'd just go back and sit with Nicholas when Arista screamed. Mikhail stood and started for the door. Keep him out. He'd already put a hand on Mikhail's shoulder when Veronica stepped out. She's fine. It, it won't be long now till pup number one is born. Come on, Alma. We could use another set of hands. Daniel clenched his teeth when, instead of complying, the woman turned her eyes up to Regis for permission first. He nodded his head briefly, and she followed Veronica out of the room. Why don't we go... why don't we go outside? If you can't hear what's going on. Daniel started but trailed off, unsure of what to say next. That won't work with our hearing. Regis growled beside him. Then he sighed. Ugh. But you could use the air. Come on. I'm not leaving her, Mikhail said, looking at the two of them like they'd lost their mind. You need the air, and to calm down before you destroy the living room, Regis said sternly as he started to forcibly drag his brother out the door. Daniel kept a hand on his shoulder to keep him from turning back towards the bedroom. He wondered about destroying the living room comment as they walked. Sure, Mikhail was upset they weren't willing to let him in to see Arista, though he didn't exactly understand why they weren't. Wasn't it normal for the father to be by the mother's side during the childbirth? But destroying things in a temper tantrum seemed more like something Regis would do. Mikhail started to pace again as soon as they got him outside. What is it? He turned when Regis spoke to him, sneering at him. You have a stupid look on your face. He scowled at him for a moment and then sighed. Ugh. I'm confused. Why isn't he allowed to see her? Fathers are usually by the mother's side during times like this, right? 
and Regis scoffed and turned back to his brother. Huh, maybe that's how it is in the human world, and if it were his second or third child, it might be safe for him to be in there. But you see how agitated he is. It's taken all of his concentration to keep this form. If he were to look down and see the pain on her face, he'd lose his resolve and shift right there in the room. His face almost looked vulnerable as he spoke, and then his scowl returned and he turned back to him. Someone would likely get hurt if that happened, don't you think? Daniel mashed his look for a moment before turning away. He guessed it made sense. Regis had been right about being outside and not keeping a sound away. They had to restrain Mikhail several times over the next half hour or so, as even his ears had no problem picking up Arista's screams. He also had no trouble picking out the first infant's cry, or the second. After the second one sounded, Mikhail turned to the two of them, giving them a look that dared them to try to restrain him again. And then he burst past them back into the house. He stepped back into the living room just in time to see Veronica step out of the back room with a smile. You have two healthy-looking pups, Alpha Mikel. A son, born first, and then a daughter. He smiled brightly and rushed past her into the room. Alma walked out a second later and, head bowed, skittered right back to Regis's side. Daniel clinched his teeth and took a deep breath. He looked up when Veronica placed a hand on his arm. He tried to give her a reassurance smile, but he knew it wasn't believable. Two weeks had passed, and with the exception of his boss, when he called and told him he had to quit suddenly because he was moving out of town, he hadn't talked to a single soul outside of the pack. Helene and Nicholas had given him an empty trailer just a few doors down from Mikhail's house. He did everything he could around the area to contribute helping with hunting and firewood, and they all agreed he shouldn't leave the compound until he was able to shift at will. Extreme emotion, whether it be rage, sadness, or fear, could cause a shift if they weren't careful. Until he was able to control this, it wasn't safe for him to be around humans. One of the ways to help was to become more in tune with their animalistic side. Once he was able to shift and be comfortable in that form, he would be better able to hold off a change when it tried to trigger involuntarily. But he wouldn't be able to change voluntarily at all until after his first full moon, which was only a few hours away. He found himself unable to sit still, which they assured him was normal early on. He'd taken to sleeping during the day as most of their kind did, but he made a point to be up in time to help Veronica with her classes. Mikhail had readily agreed that two separate classes it was a good idea. Now she had doubled her workload, she was able to do more with each set of kids than she ever had been able to as a whole. Today, however, sleep evaded him, and as mostly everyone in the compound was asleep, there was no work going on to distract him. He tried to sit down and work on his notes, but he couldn't keep still long enough. Two days from now, he and Mikhail were going to address the pack about the things they talked about the night the twins were born. Mikhail had told him, he was also going to announce to them that he was naming him his second. He was confused by this term and why he'd even consider him for anything. But Mikhail told him that, as someone who had spent his life on the outside, and not sheltered in this one small community, that he would have thoughts and ideas about how their kind could improve. That one born his way would never, ever think of. When he told Veronica about this later that night, he'd been surprised at her reaction. Her jaw very nearly hit the floor. She explained to him further the honor of the title. Being Mikkel's second meant that he was second in command of the entire pack. He stood as not only advisor to Mikkel, but as an enforcer of his edicts. Learning this, he went back to talk to Mikkel that morning before sunrise. Veronica told him it wouldn't be a good idea to refuse the honor. I will be considered a great insult. Instead of saying he didn't want it, he tried to explain to the man that he wasn't the best choice for the honour. Hated as he might, he had to admit that Regis's obvious reaction to this new information had worried him. He was obviously the best choice for this role, despite the circumstances that had kept him from becoming Alpha. However, Mikhail hadn't agreed with him. <laughs> 
He said his brother may have the skills and knowledge to enforce his edicts, but he was as set in the ways as any other of the pack. In order to bring them to a brighter future, they needed someone like him, and he hadn't agreed with that. After all, no one had ever needed him. But he didn't say as much. He merely told Mikkel he would be honoured to accept the position. He hadn't had much choice in the end. He turned at the sound of Veronica's voice to see her standing in his open doorway. He'd been so distracted with his thoughts that he hadn't heard her approach, which was amazing. His hearing, sight, and even sense of smell had improved significantly since the change. The dual free seemed extra sensitive today. He tried to give her a smile, but he was sure it looked more like a grimace. What are you doing here so early? It's not even three. They told him they'd be there to pick him up at sunset. He, Veronica, Helene, Nicholas, Arista, and Mikhail will be together tonight. He didn't want to know the details of what would happen beforehand. He'd seen movies. He knew most of it was bullshit, but somehow it got him quite a bit right. He didn't want to talk about the pain. He tried not to think about it at all. But of course his mind wouldn't be distracted from the thought of it for long. It made him sick with panic. He'd endured pain before. Broken bones. The car accident that had led him to be here had not been his first. But he knew nothing would compare to this. He shook his head to dispel his thoughts. Nothing would happen until around midnight. At least the actual physical change. But this antsy feeling would steadily get worse and worse once the sun went down. I figured you were driving yourself crazy just sitting around. I thought we'd go for a hike through the woods. It will help burn off some of the adrenaline, at least. He nodded. Sitting around here, waiting for dark would drive him insane. I slid a note under the Alpha's door, telling him approximately where we would be. When he reached her side, she held her hand out to him, and he didn't hesitate to take it. He spent pretty much all of his free time with Veronica. She was the only good thing to come out of all of this. He followed silently as she drug him towards the school building. Of course, that wasn't completely true. While she was undoubtedly the best thing, there were other things he had now that he didn't really have before. He never really made friends beyond acquaintances. He just never really clicked with any of the people he had met. His parents had died when he was 16 and he had no other family that he knew of. Instead of staying in foster care, he had struck out on his own. His parents had never really been affectionate. They took care of his physical needs, but beyond that, they pretty much had nothing to do with them. This community had quickly become a family to him. Helene practically drug him to her house for meals when he tried to refuse. Mikhail, Arista, and the pups were always there. He'd even broken bread with Regis on a few occasions. The man ignored him completely, like he wasn't sitting there, and he supposed that that was some sort of progress, though whether in the right direction, he wasn't sure. He blinked when a hand holding his tightened, and he looked up from the ground where he'd been contemplating to offer her a smile. While he'd been distracted, Veronica had led him off to the right towards the trees. I'm going to show you to my favourite spot, she said with a smile that turned to a pout. It's beautiful in winter, but nothing compared to summer. I can't wait to go for a swim again, she said with a look of longing, and he smiled. His ears picked up to the sound as he walked. It was hard to make out what it was at first, but the farther they walked, the more he started to recognise the sound of running water. It was just a trickle, like a faucet on a low. They walked for a good half hour, more before Veronica slowed. She let go of his hand to push past some long dead vines, and once they reached the other side, she turned to him with a smile, and his eyes widened. They were standing at the top of a cliff, overlooking a wide river, it was at least 50 feet below, and to the right was a waterfall. Most of it was still frozen over, but the slightly warmer temperatures of the day had melted the ice just enough that the water was trickling down the waterfall, which looked honestly like a giant icicle into the near-frozen river below. Oh, that's beautiful, he said, reaching out to take her hand again. And she smiled, and then shook her head. You think it's beautiful now? Just wait until I bring you out here in the summer. It's gorgeous! We usually jump from a spot on the other side, 
It's too rocky over here. We camp out by the river, catch fish, sleep out under the stars. And he smiled and pulled her into his side as they both looked down into the frozen water. Even its beauty and the girl pressed into his side were enough to distract him for long. And when she noticed his breathing began to quicken, she pulled away and turned back towards the forest. Come on, I'll show you a few other places. And he wasn't sure how he hadn't had a heart attack yet, the way his heart was pounding in his chest. It was nearly midnight and at this point he was pacing in a tight circle while the others ringed around him. He did his best to ignore the fact that they were all completely naked. It won't be much longer, Daniel. I promise, Veronica said anxiously. He didn't have it in him to try and reassure her that he was fine anymore. He just kept pacing. If everyone has to change during a full moon, where are the pups? He asked, searching for anything to distract himself. He didn't look up as he spoke. The change doesn't start until puberty. On full moons, we convert the school into a giant sleeping area for all of the children. The older ones look after the smaller ones. Several members of the pack remain behind to protect the school. Not that it's necessary, but we won't leave anything to chance when it comes to our pups. He nodded his head and continued pacing. He froze in his tracks when his heartbeat changed. It gave one hard thump and then went completely still for a fraction of a second. His eyes widened in panic. He had given himself a heart attack. That thought had barely formed in his mind when his ears registered the sound of someone moaning. He started to lift his head but froze when his heart began to pound again. He fell to his knees when he was overcome with pain beyond any he could have ever imagined. It started in his skull and he grabbed a hold of it in an attempt to hold it together. He'd barely wrapped his hands around it when the pain shifted forward into his face. He put his hand to it and he could feel his face shifting, his mouth and nose pushing outward. He screamed out in pain and the sound changing with each passing second. But when the pain entered his torso, he fell over onto his side. He could feel his chest expanding and his ribs and sternum breaking to make room for it to do so. He lay there, unable to even scream out any more, as he felt his first spine snapping and reforming, and then his limbs. The pain ended as suddenly as it had begun, and there was no tapering off. One moment he had been in agony, far worse than he had ever imagined, and the next the pain was completely gone. He hadn't a clue how long had passed, he figured it had only been a few minutes though honestly, it had felt like days. He kept his eyes firmly closed. He was afraid to open them, afraid to see through his new eyes. And there was a low whining sound by his side that made him finally move. He opened his eyes only for them to snap shut again. And there was a full moon out, but even with his improved sight, which they told him would be even better in this form, he hadn't expected the night to seem as bright as day. He felt something touch his arm. It felt like a hand, but off somehow. He opened his eyes again slowly. His first instinct was to run when he saw the figure knelt over him. But even in this form, he could recognize the concerned face staring down at him. The form was undoubtedly female. On the night he'd tried to escape this place, he'd been too shocked upon seeing the figure standing on the hill that his mind hadn't been able to focus on many details, just the basic shape and colors. He examined Veronica now. Her form had changed drastically, but he still knew that it was her. Her colouring was close to Arista's, just a shade lighter. Her eyes were the same piercing blue he'd often gotten lost in, only brighter, like two small moons staring back at him. While she definitely had a snout, it wasn't especially elongated. The features were definitely canine, though the expression on her face was undoubtedly human. Two ears on top of her head were pulled down as low whines escaped her. And he managed to push himself into a sitting position and looked down at his hands. While the other side had pads like a dog, the top part still mostly retained a human shape. His nails were pointed and razor sharp. He heard a sound like a short low howl and turned his head in its direction. Mikkel, Arista, Nicholas and Helene were all standing watching him a few feet away 
It was easy to tell who was who. Both males and both females were in stark contrast. Dark fur to grey, two standing tall, two hunched with age. Mikhail gave him a nod, and he knew they had no real way of communicating with each other in this form. He listened when they told him that much, but he understood the look Mikhail was giving him. It's time to get up now, his own mind told him. It's time to run, to hunt, to play. His eyes widened when a surge of excitement ran through him. He wanted to run, needed it. The feeling of no longer being able to sit still hit him again, and he tried to pull himself to his feet, only to fall right back down again. It wasn't that his body felt weak, quite the opposite. He felt like he could pull a tree out by the roots if he tried hard enough. But it was difficult to gain his feet with these legs. Like a child trying to walk for the first time. Once he managed to stand, before even attempting to take a single step, he turned to the others. Their legs seemed to still retain a somewhat human shape, but the feet, well, they were an odd mix of both canine and human, just like his hands were. He took a small step, and then another, and then fell down to all fours. The others followed suit. Mikhail came towards him, slowly. His movements didn't look like a dog's walk or like a human would walk in on all fours. It was something in between. He stopped for a second when he was a few feet away and then ran around him in a blur. Before he could even turn his head, Mikhail had snapped his teeth down on the end of his tail that he hadn't even known he had. He couldn't help giving a thing an experimental swish. Mikhail's bite hadn't been hard. It was obvious he was being playful. The look he was giving him suggested it was his turn to try the move. He took off for the run towards him, but... Unused to moving on his new legs, his front paw slid out from underneath him, and he landed face first into a clump of half-frozen mud. But once he got all four feet firmly beneath him, he noticed a strange sound. It was something between a choking sound and a bark. He turned to see that the noise was coming from Helene and Nicholas, and they were shaking their heads. It was obvious the noise they were making was laughter. He turned to his right when he heard a low growling noise. It was Veronica. She stood completely still for a moment, and then took a single step forward, and then another, and another. He watched her legs closely, knowing this was what she wanted. He mirrored her movements for a few moments, and then jumped when he felt teeth clamp down on his tail again. He whirled around to find Mikhail making that same choking bark sound that Helene and Nicholas had been making. And he used what Veronica had just taught him and took Mikhail by surprise, managing to dart around him and nip him on the tail. This caused more laughing, barks from all of those gathered. Mikhail turned to him and lifted his front arm or paw. He wasn't sure what to call it anymore, and placed it upon his shoulder. Then he and Arista stood on their hind legs. He watched as he held out his paw slash hand to her, and she took it. It looked difficult with the shape, and then the two turned away from them and raced into the trees. He turned towards Helene and Nicholas when one of them made a sound. Helene gave him what he was sure was supposed to be a smile, but it was quite menacing in this form. And then they two turned and headed off into another direction. He turned back to Veronica. She inclined her head towards the woods before heading off into the trees. And they stayed on all fours, walking at first, and then she broke into a run and he found himself smiling as he chased after her. Even as he fell face first on occasion, he still had a smile when he picked himself back up. This was what his body wanted. After what had to have been an hour of chasing each other through the woods, he stopped in his tracks. His nose had picked up a faint scent in the air. He took a deeper sniff. He wasn't sure what it was. He just knew he wanted it badly. He turned towards Veronica, she had her head lifted, sent in the air. His smile widened, and he took another long sniff to pinpoint the direction the delicious smell was coming from. Once he had a head in, he took off at the fastest speed he could manage with his still clumsy feet. He realized what was happening when he entered the clearing and saw the deer. His mind briefly faltered, but his legs didn't even slow. He pounced when he was still a few yards away, but he hid his mark. The poor thing didn't have a chance to be afraid. 
When he finished his meal, he turned. Veronica was standing at the edge of the clearing, just inside the trees. At first, he thought she was disappointed at what he'd done. And then he realized that he'd fully let the animal side take over in that moment. And would his instincts have wanted him to fight her for the meal, if she were at his side? He backed away from the carcass guiltily then. He didn't think any instinct could make him want to fight her for any reason. And he used his poor hands to wipe as much of the deer's blood off his face as he could before going over to join her. He wanted to find some way to reassure her that he wouldn't have fought her for the deer. And she started to turn away and he stopped her by trying to imitate the low wine she'd used while he'd been curled up on the ground. And she smiled and turned back. And as he walked towards her, a sudden instinct overtook him. And when he reached her side, he leaned forward and bit her on the back of the neck. The bite wasn't that hard. Not hard enough to draw blood, but it hadn't exactly been gentle either. And she stiffened. His first instinct was to try and find some way to show her that he was sorry, that he didn't know why he'd done it. And when she turned, she nuzzled his neck with her head, almost like a cat. And then he felt her teeth sink into the back of his neck. He stiffened as pleasure beyond any he'd ever experienced or imagined washed through him. And he turned to her then and nuzzled her as she'd done him. Whoa, I got you. It's okay. It's, it's normal for the first few times. The weakness never completely goes away, but it greatly lessens over time. Mikhail said as he grabbed his arm and pulled it over his shoulder. Daniel appreciated it. His legs felt weaker than he ever had in his entire life. The freezing cold temperature was helping keep him awake. It was odd, though. He fully felt the cold. His bare feet didn't hurt walking across the half-frozen ground. Just help him back home as is Mikel. I mean, Alpha Mikel. It's easier than trying to dress him. I'll grab his clothes and meet you there in a few minutes. Veronica called from behind them. The transformation back had been painful, but nothing compared to what he'd gone through the night before. They continued forward towards the compound, both stark naked, but he was too tired to care. So, how did you enjoy your experience during the first full moon? Mikel asked and he was practically dragging him back. After he had bid Veronica, the two had spent most of the rest of the night just laying curled together on the forest floor. The wolf inside him enjoyed this as much as it had the running and the deer meat. He still didn't understand what had happened. You fall asleep? And he shook his head. He felt sort of embarrassed at the thought of talking about it, but he wanted to understand why he'd bitten her, and why he'd felt the way he had when she'd bitten him back. Last night, I, I killed a deer. He looked up to see Mikkel nodding. Perfectly natural. The animalistic side craves meat. You won't always want to kill, but the desire will be there, on occasion. He nodded. After Veronica was acting funny, Mikkel sighed. Did you? Uh, no, no. He responded quickly. No, Mikkel was thinking the same thing that he knew she had been last night. That's the thing. I know I wouldn't have hurt her. I just fill it with certainty, you know? But after... What? Mikhail asked as he stopped to open a door to Daniel's trailer. Oh, I bit her. He said finally, once Mikhail sat him down on the side of his bed. And he froze. You bit her? He nodded. I don't understand. It was, it was after I'd finished the deer. I was just thinking that I wanted to express to her in some way that... I wouldn't have attacked her. Then I... Then I bit her. Mikhail sighed and leaned into the wall by his door. What happened after? After? How did she respond? He fell back into bed, pulling his covers over him. He was freezing. He started to feel more uncomfortable being nude in front of the other man. Though he seemed to be unconcerned about his own nudity. She bit me back. Mikhail was smiling at this point. And when she bit you, how did it feel? He thought back on the sensation and how incredible it felt. He closed his eyes with a smile, just at the memory of it. He turned towards Mikhail when he heard him chuckle. He could feel his face and entire body turning red. Ah, it's okay, Daniel. In fact, it's better than okay. This is good. I'm happy for the both of you. He wanted to sit up, but honestly, he didn't have the strength. 
How happy we, we bit each other. He laughed. I'm happy you enjoyed it. His blush deepened and Mikkel shook his head. Let me explain. There are occasions where us wolfmen find our true mates this way. Not all of us are this lucky. Arista and I are true mates, as our grandfather and grandmother, and Regis and his first wife. My parents cared deeply for each other, but they were not true mates. That's not to say other couples can't find happiness, but not like true mates can. Eventually, you'll be able to communicate with each other in the other form. Know what each other is thinking. Like telepathy? Mikhail shook his head. I'm not familiar with this term. It's not exactly thoughts, more like images and feelings. Your bond will be strong. Not to say you will never fight, but true mates are for life. I'm happy for you, Daniel. I feared you'd never find happiness, thanks to what I did to you. He looked through the open bedroom door to see Veronica approaching. She had gone home to change. His bundle were clothes held at her right side. Mikkel shoved off the wall. We'll be heading home to Arista and the pups. I'll leave you in Nurse Veronica's more than capable hands. I'll see you tomorrow, he said before walking past her out of the door. You all right? Your face is red. He looked up to see her looking down at him in concern. He gave her a small smile before scooting against the wall and patting a mattress in front of him. She lay down beside him without hesitation, kicking her shoes off at the foot of the bed, and he wrapped his arm around her. You know... You almost make this whole turning into a mythical creature thing worth it, he said with a smile. And she laughed just before he drifted off to sleep. He heard her response. I could have been worse. We could have been vampires. She said the last word with a bit of disgust. A small part of his mind wondered if they were real too, but he fell asleep before he could ask. Daniel? He stopped his pacing and turned at the sound of Veronica's voice. All the adults in the pack were meeting inside the school. It was the largest building in the compound by far, and it was really the only place large enough for everyone when an alpha called for a gathering. Mikhail would be contacting the other alphas in the state about the alpha council sometime after the next moon. They had discussed it, and he decided that his first big act as alpha would be to do something about getting fresh blood in the pack. But he would not trade their women like cattle to do it. Is it time? She nodded. You can do this, you know. He wished he had her confidence. He spent a lot of time around the children of the pack. Veronica called him her assistant, though he had absolutely no business teaching anyone. But for them, he had to make things better around here. He took her hand and led her inside. They stood by the back of the room while Mikkel addressed the pack. When he called his name, he gave her hand a squeeze and made his way through to others towards the front of the room. Most of you have met Daniel by now. He's been very helpful to both Veronica and myself since becoming a part of our pack. He's smart, but more than that, he was born on the outside. For the most part, we don't care about the ways of humans. Those that still believe us nothing more than bloodthirsty monsters. But we've seen firsthand who the real monsters are, and lost much at their hands. And he cleared his throat. <clears> throat> Having been born on the outside means Daniel has thoughts and ideas that we would not be able to think of. It is for this reason I have decided to appoint him as my second. Well, the crowd had been completely silent up to this point, but that was no longer the case. One voice rang out much louder than the others. Its speaker began stomping towards the front of the room. Tell me you are joking, brother. Regis practically snarled. My decision has been made, Regis, and while we may be brothers, I remind you, that I am your Alpha, and you will stand by my decisions. And Daniel stood tall by his side. If he showed any fear now, the pack, or they would devour him. You will choose this neophyte over your own brother, someone who knows nothing of our ways. I would, because he has a strong mind and a caring heart. He may be ignorant to our ways now, but when I'm done with him, he will be the perfect choice. Now sit back down in your chair, or get out. We still have much to discuss. And Regis stared his brother down for a few more seconds before turning towards the exit, and were followed quickly behind him. 
Mikkel, are you sure about this? He asked, for what had to be the fifteenth time since the man had offered him the position. And he turned a small smile his way. When Regis approached, you didn't back down, but you didn't engage. Had he been my second and another approached me like that, he would have hurt them. You took two unconscious steps towards my side, but made no other move, I'm sure. He turned back to the pack. If everyone would settle down now, we can get back to business. Well, I took a full minute for the murmurs to die down. Once it was mostly quiet, Mikhail began again, as if he hadn't been interrupted. This pack is steadily dying out. Because of improper records of our children, are sometimes born deformed or mentally impaired. This is no life for them, and if it continues, the pack will continue to weaken until eventually dies out. In times past, we would select some of our healthiest young women and trade them to another pack. I refuse to treat any member of this pack like cattle. Daniel and I have been discussing this. Daniel. Daniel took one final deep breath before stepping forward. It is our hope that the other alphas will agree to allow the younger members of the packs to get to know each other. We haven't hammered out all the details yet, but this is our hope that each young man and woman will be able to make their own choices on who they want to be with and which pack they belong to after. When a murmur started up again, low at first, but they were growing louder. One man stood from his chair and there were two girls in their late teens at his side. He recognized them from school. What do you mean the women will get to choose? He said angrily. And Mikhail stepped forward. Deacon, he said in a tone that sounded half like a warning and half as if it were meant to calm him. No one man or woman will be forcibly made to leave their family behind to become part of another pack, nor will they be forced to stay in this one. They will all have the right to choose. Though there were still a lot of details to work out, and this wouldn't go over well with every alpha, he had to hope there were a few of them out there willing to give it a try. The women in the pack would no longer be treated like possessions by the men, be they their fathers or husbands, and he would make that a reality, or die trying. But the crowd was no longer murmuring, and some were sitting stunned. Some looked hopeful, others like Deacon, who was now approaching the front of the room, now looked violent. He stopped about five feet away after a warning look from Mikkel, and then turned to glare at Daniel. I decide when, who, and if my girls would get married, not someone tainted by the filthy human world. Daniel took a step forward. They aren't your property, and the Alpha decides what's best for the pack, and that includes its women. I invoke the right to challenge, the man called out, and the room silenced immediately. Deacon, Mikkel said. He noticed the man's face had paled, and Deacon turned away from them both and faced the crowd. This neophyte is tainted with the evil of the world of men. He has come here to corrupt us, and your new alpha hangs on his every word. Deacon, Daniel cannot be challenged. Our law states that new wolves cannot challenge, or be challenged for their first six months. He isn't able to shift on command yet. He only had one moon. You see how the Alpha defends him, protects him. Trust me, if we don't do something now, this man will be the downfall of this pack. While the murmur started up again, Daniel turned to Helene and Nicholas. They looked nervous and were quickly making their way towards them. So was Veronica. He didn't want any of them caught in the middle of this. This had been his idea. He had talked to Mikkel about it, and been warned it would not go over well. He remembered what Mikkel had said the night the twins were born, when he told him what would happen if he tried to go in overnight and change everything. I don't know much about the human history. It was never taught to us, but I do know of the Civil War. Imagine a smaller scale version of that, and with fangs and claws. When Veronica reached his side, he took her hand and pulled her behind him. He had to yell to be heard over the crowd. I accept, and the crowd went silent immediately. I accept your challenge, Deacon. Mikhail put a hand on his shoulder. Daniel, you can't accept. The challenge means a fight in wolf form. You've only had one moon. You don't know how to change on command yet. 
He shook his head and pulled free of his circle of protectors. He couldn't let them defend him when he had riled up the crowd like this. It wouldn't end peacefully. He wouldn't back down no matter the consequences. I accept your challenge, Deacon. But as the Alpha said, I haven't learned to shift on command yet. Five weeks, one week after the next full moon, then we fight. On a pack erupted in cheers. Deacon looked around a moment and then turned back and nodded. I accept your conditions. In five weeks, I'll prove to them, and you, just how worthless you are. He looked past him to Mikkel. Regis should have been Alpha, not you. Mikkel took a step forward. Despite his words, Deacon took a step back in obvious fear. I challenged him and won. Do you wish to challenge me now as well, Deacon? Or are you done trying to show to others what a big bad wolf you are? He backed down then and grabbed his wife by the wrist before heading for the exit. His daughters went far behind. Daniel, you didn't have to do that. We could have. Mikhail trailed off. Yes, I did. You know I did. If I'd backed down and you defended me, it would have turned into a fight. I have to prove to them that you made a good choice in choosing me. Mikhail put his hand on his shoulder. I know I did. Daniel looked down at his watch. It was almost 11.30. The fight was at noon. At noon, he'd turn into half-wolf creature and fight another half-wolf creature until one of them surrendered or could no longer move. How had this become his life? He turned and grabbed the shaking hand of the girl standing beside him. Amazingly, she was even more nervous than he was. He looked down at the bracelet tied to her wrist and then to his own, where an almost identical one sat a few told him he'd be wearing a bracelet one day made from the hair of a werewolf that he was in love with. <laughs> he'd never have believed it. Even ignoring the fact that the thought of werewolves being real was just insane. And he'd never in a million years have believed they were real if he hadn't seen them with his own two eyes and then became one. He never thought he'd fall in love and now he had. Nicholas and Helene and Mikhail and Arista had similar bracelets. They marked him as mates and served this werewolf equivalent of a wedding ring. He'd worked hard to prepare for the fight, turning at least 15 times since his first moon. The pain was still unimaginable, but the weakness he felt after was beginning to lessen. He still tripped on his own two feet occasionally when he tried to run on two legs, and he hadn't been able to land a single hit on Mikkel. And they'd all tried to reassure him by telling him that Deacon would be nowhere near as powerful as Mikkel was, and that this would also be his first fight wolf form. He pretended their assurances made him feel more confident, but they really didn't. The man still had nearly twenty more years of experience moving around in wolf form than he had. He pulled Veronica into his chest. I'll be all right, you know. I can beat him. She nodded into his chest, but didn't lift her head. He knew how much she wanted to believe in him, but the odds weren't in his favor. She pulled back when they heard footsteps approaching. No matter what happens, it won't change the way I feel about you. You know that, right? He nodded. You ready to head out? He looked up at the sound of Mikhail's voice. Helene and Nicholas were standing at his side. Helene offered him an encouraging smile. Out of all of them, including himself, she seemed to be the only one convinced that he could actually do this. Women weren't allowed to challenge anyone for any reason, but she'd seen enough of these fights over her years to offer him plenty. Of advice. As ready as I'm gonna be. He pulled his shirt over his head and turned back to hand it to Veronica. Do I change here or? He asked once he was finished getting undressed. It was warmer today than it had been but still barely above freezing. He may not feel the cold the same way that he used to but he could still feel it. No, you'll both change at the same time. Now he'll be faster than you but he's not allowed to attack until you're fully transformed. Mikhail said as he led the way through the trees towards the clearing. It was the same one they'd used for every challenge since the pack settled in these woods 15 years before. Apparently challenges were common. They weren't always done to settle disputes. Sometimes the younger males just used them to test their strength against their peers. When they reached the clearing, it was ringed by spectators, the closest of which stepped aside at their approach. 
and Deacon were standing at the opposite end of the clearing, looking completely unaffected by what was to come. He had his arms crossed over his chest and was standing there talking to a group of men from the more traditional families. When all the other chatter died down, thanks to their arrival, he turned in their direction and started making his way slowly forwards. He stopped roughly in the centre. Daniel took a deep breath and then turned to place a kiss on Veronica's forehead. She had his clothing wrapped up in her arms in front of her, like a shield. Oh, it'll be okay, he said before turning back and making his way forward to meet him in the middle. Deacon wasn't looking towards him, and he followed his line of sight to see him watch him. Helene leaped Veronica into the ring, the spectators. Don't worry, honey. I'll try not to do any permanent damage to your mate here. He should still be able to perform when I'm done with him, he said before turning back to look at him. If he ever could. <laughs> Laughter erupted from some of the males in the group. The less involved part of his brain wanted him to respond by telling a man that, judging by what he had on display in front of everyone, it was his performance that would be called into question. But he kept his mouth closed. Mikhail stood by their sides, looking down at an old pocket watch, and when he raised his fist in the air, and the laughter and chatter cut off immediately. As you all know, there were only two rules to a challenge. No ripping out the throat or stomach of your opponent. The match continues until one loses consciousness, or can no longer stand, or by some sign or other admits defeat. Mikhail patted him on the shoulder before going to stand beside the others in the crowd. Let the challenge begin! Before he could even open his eyes, much less stand, Deacon tackled him to the ground. He managed to open his eyes just in time to rake his claws across the man's face, who was leaning in, teeth bared. He was too shocked to put much force behind the attack, so he didn't manage to do much damage. Luckily, though, the hit did cause him to lean up and grab his face, and he was able to roll out from beneath him. He climbed quickly to his feet and did a waste time kicking his foot out and into the man's shoulder to knock him onto his back. He went to pin him down, but the man recovered quickly, sending his claws out across his chest. Deacon's hit was much more effective than his had been, and he cried out in pain and took a step back to assess the damage. It was hard to tell how deep the scratches were through the blood and matted fur. Letting his guard down had been a stupid idea. Deacon was on his feet in a flash and had scrambled up behind him and wrapped his arms around his midsection like a vice before he could even try to dodge. Daniel struggled to breathe as he tried unsuccessfully, to pry the man's arms away. Luckily, Deacon had had the foresight to pin his arms to the side, and he reached behind him blindly and clawed at the man's face. The man screamed and released him. He turned quickly to face him, gasping for air. Deacon had both hands up covering his face, and Daniel rushed forward intending to shove him down to the ground and pin him, but Deacon recovered quicker than he had expected. Daniel tried to stop in his tracks, but... He tripped over his own feet in the process. And Deacon seized the opportunity his clumsiness provided and grabbed a hold of his wrist with a one hand and his upper arm with the other. In a move so fast he was unable to do anything to stop it, Deacon snapped his right elbow like a twig. He screamed out in pain and tried to slash out with his left claws, but Deacon danced out the way and used his broken limb to slam him down onto the ground. He couldn't let him pin him. If he did... It was over. White, hot rage filled him, and the animal within took control. He rolled quickly to one side, surprising Deacon enough that he let go of his wrist and overbalanced. Daniel jumped to his feet and charged him, his broken limb laying useless at his side. Deacon regained his feet quickly and was able to dodge out of the way. Unable to stop himself, Daniel ran past him a few feet before finally coming to a halt. And when he turned, Deacon was barreling towards him. Instead of dodging the attack, Daniel ran straight ahead to meet him, and with a roar, he lifted his left arm up to clothesline the other man. The impact sent him to the ground, and Daniel wasted no time falling down on top of him. He opened his mouth, his instincts told him to tear out the man's throat, but he had just enough control of himself to aim for the man's shoulder instead. He sunk his teeth viciously, biting clear down to the bone, and he could hear the man howling out in pain and feel him struggling beneath him. 
Daniel, stop! You've won! Stop! His mind registered the sound of the voice, but not what it was saying, and he turned in its direction and snarled. Mikkel was standing a few feet away. The moment he saw his face, his anger melted, but it wasn't until he looked past him and saw Veronica staring at him in shock that he came fully to his senses and realized what he was doing. He stood and looked down. Deacon was staring up at him in obvious fear, but there was more there. It was a look of respect. He took in the faces all around him. Everyone in the crowd had a similar look. He had earned their respect, but he'd almost had to lose himself to do it. You didn't go for his throat, Daniel. He turned back to Mikkel. You could have, but you didn't. He nodded his head, but Mikkel's words didn't make him feel any better. He wanted to rip the man's throat out. Only a tiny part of his mind still held reason enough to stop him. He fell to his knees and groaned at the pain of his transformation. And right now, he just wanted to feel human again. He looked down at his chest. The scratches had already begun to heal, but blood was still seeping out of them. His elbow was shattered, and he knew that would take at least a day to heal completely. He looked up to Mikkel. He had his hand out to help him up, and he extended out his left hand. He needed the help with the shift, the pain, and the blood loss, and he doubted his ability to stand up on his own. Once he was standing, the Alpha lifted his arm into the air, and those gathered erupted in cheers. This, oh, this was his life now. Aggression, I was part of it. He just had to hope he could continue to hold on to his humanity when it tried to take over. And he looked around. Veronica, Helene, and Nicholas smiled back at him. Nicholas's face showed a hint of surprise, while Helene's didn't show even a little. He took in the faces of the others. He knew if he hadn't agreed to this fight that he had never been able to gain their respect, and he'd need it if he and Mikkel were ever going to be able to make changes around here. His eyes froze when they landed on the one subdued face in the crowd. He hadn't noticed him, but he should have known the man would be there, hoping to see him lose. And Regis made eye contact with him for nearly a full minute before he gave his head a small bow. And then he took Alma by the hand and left. And that small bit of recognition by the man who hated him the most was even more shocking to him than his victory that day. I knew you could do it! He turned when Veronica reached his side and put his left arm over her shoulder. Uh-huh, he said sarcastically, with a small laugh. It was the most he could manage at that moment. Are you all right? She asked with worry, and he knew he was leaning on her pretty heavily. No, he answered honestly. He leaned down and kissed her. But I will be. He turned when he felt a hand on his shoulder to see Mikkel. The man's face had a smile at first, and then it turned serious. Enjoy this, Daniel, because soon the real work begins. Wow, 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 wow. Certainly a howl in another one. Wow. Absolutely chest-pounding, riveting, and romantic story there from the incredible mind of Brandy. Firstly, a huge thank you to you, Brandy, for your patience. As you know, I've been having quite a lot of problems. And life has a funny habit of getting in the way of good things. But uh, I really do appreciate your support, your input, and I really do hope you continue your writing and look to publish your work in some form or format. Guys and girls as ever, you know the drill. Please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help out the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. If you're an aspiring writer or would just like to have a crack at things like myself, then please do get in touch with me at the brand new contact email, which is as on screen. Contact the dead one at gmail. I really look forward to hearing from you. I hope everybody's had a fantastic week at work, school, studying, or maybe you're a long-distance driver 
whatever it is that you do, I hope you're reaching for greatness and settling for nothing less. But above all, guys, remember, be safe, not sorry.